totally. But here's the thing yeah. is that like, say I make a drug that can cure two people, but kills the other eight that take it, right? Okay. That means the individual outcomes are crazy good, right? Like if I can get those two people cured, if I can get the drug to those two people or find those two people. Out of the 10. Out of the 10 yeah. and get them cured, like that would be awesome. Okay. The problem is the FDA doesn't work based on individual outcomes, right? Right. Because the whole way clinical trials are set it's up. It's population medicine. Exactly. Right? Yeah. It's population medicine. It's not individual outcome medicine. Right. And what we need is a system that allows individual outcome medicine. Hey, friends. Welcome to this week's episode of the HVMN Podcast. It's been a while since we've had a biohacker on the show, so I invited my friend, Dr. Josiah Zayner, to join us today. Josiah holds a PhD in molecular biophysics and was previously employed with NASA to engineer bacteria to terraform Mars. He has a very impressive list of biohacking experiments. He's sterilized and replaced his entire microbiome through a fecal transplant, attempted to genetically engineer the color of his skin, and was known as the first person to do a direct gene editing experiment with CRISPR-Cas9. He's also a recent father, so congratulations to him and his partner. So in today's episode, we discuss the nuances of genetic engineering, increasing one's creativity and divergent thinking by reading atypical books, and explore how the biohacking space can mature and evolve alongside regulatory agencies like the FDA. This is a fun one, so I'm excited for you guys to tune in. As always, please send my producer Zill and I feedback at podcast at hvmn.com. iTunes reviews are always appreciated, and remember, you'll score a free Sprint Mini in the process. Okay, let's get started. Josiah, thanks for coming on the program. Oh yeah, no problem. It's been a while since we last hung out, so I know this is like a long time coming because we've been on a couple different panels and conferences together. We actually had a false start with our yeah, first think, try of the we podcast. Did, we tried two we, two times. This is our our third, but hey, you know, third, third time's yeah. a charm. This That's is gonna right. go. This is gonna. This is gonna be awesome. Um, so where should we start? One thing I want to start with. Okay. So I recently started. You know, it's only been like a month. But I recently started, you know, going on like a keto type diet, huh. uh, trying to lose some weight. Because and your experience so far? It's interesting because like the first, I don't know, like two weeks or something like that, you feel like you're dying. Yeah. <laughs> keto flu, keto adaptation period. <laughs> but then after that, you're like stomach shrinks and you like start losing weight. And it's crazy. And now like... The portion size I eat are smaller just because I get full faster, yeah. right? And uh, yeah, it, it seems to be working out great. What are uh, the metrics? I mean, what are you measuring? Measuring mainly weights? Yeah, are you measuring, measuring me bloods? No, 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 not nothing on on like blood or anything okay. like that right now. Yeah, no, ma mainly just weight and just like my body, how I feel, you know, general stuff, energy, sleep. Yeah, the other thing is sleep. I heard, you know, and I don't, I couldn't tell if it was a keto or not because I have a hard time sleeping anyway. But some people say it's like a hard to sleep sometimes when sure. you're like are eating just like a high protein, no carb diet. So yeah, what are you eating when you're eating keto? Um, just high protein, no carb, right? So, well, I mean, I think some. So I think the, the subtleties there would, would be that. Keto is described as mainly fat, actually. Oh, fat. So eighty percent fat, eighty nine percent fat. Oh yeah, yeah. Fat, no, no, no. I don't as do as low carb as possible and moderate protein. Oh yeah, no, I don't do uh, so much fat. So you're almost like I a mean, low carb, like Atkins style diet. Oh, Atkins, yeah. Like Atkins will be basically ad libitum fat protein. It's mainly a a carb restricted diet. I don't know diet. how much fat I do. I mean, like, what are you eating? Are you eating like fatty steaks, pork? Yeah, Are you trying to add uh, a lot of chicken, steaks, uh, bacon and eggs. Okay, um, you know stuff like that. Okay, I probably had bacon and eggs every day for like the past month for breakfast. Sometimes for lunch also. Okay, I mean bacon's <laughs> fairly fatty, so I would probably guess that you're closer to maybe like a 50-50 yeah, fat protein like with like very restricted carb. Yeah. Um, you're probably getting in a ketosis. So it wouldn't be necessarily like a strict keto diet, but you're definitely carb restricting, which I think is 
half the benefit of eating keto. Oh yeah, I think it's um, a huge benefit. I don't know. And the other thing, I remember, I maybe I told you this a while ago, but like I, I used to wake up hungry in the middle of the night. Okay. Like I would wake up in the middle of the night and I would just be so hungry. Yeah. And I would have to eat something. I couldn't sleep. I was so hungry. And that like kind of went away, which is really weird. Yeah. I don't know why. Well, one of the maybe my microbiome or something starting to change, or but that's actually a common result is that fats are more satiating. Fats and proteins are more satiating than carbs, so it actually uh, affects ghrelin more potently than carbohydrate. Oh, okay. So it's just keeping me full for longer. Yeah, it's keeping you full for longer. The that's thing is, sometimes you're I don't feel full, but I guess my body is full. It, it well, like, I mean, I think if you just realize from like, you know, as you know, I do a lot of fasting. You just realize like, like your like body's like never like truly hungry. Like you're just kind of yeah, mentally totally. bored. Like what I realized when I was doing that seven day fast was that your mind literally misses the dopamine hit of like yummy stuff in your belly. And like you're, you almost well, you honest, realize the difference between like hungry, hungry and then like you're, you're bored. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, I, 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 yeah. And I think there probably is something to that if you're like very carb heavy then as you know like you spike insulin you have a blood sugar spike and you crash and then you want to eat because you want to fill up that, glu- that glucose yeah again. and like i'm you know i ate lots of pastas lots of rice so it was like you so know, you're probably pretty, just cycling pretty heavy glucose carbs. crashing and, and spiking yeah it was pretty heavy carbs so yeah. i think it probably affected me a lot more how but many yeah. how much weight have you i mean you actually do look more lean oh i don't know only like four or five pounds okay. or something but, but you still, just feel better yeah i mean like well, the thing is, like, my weight, it's like you you immediately start to feel like, I don't know, the weight is rearranging or something. And my, like, weight pant size, you yeah. know, it starts to get looser and looser. And it's, yeah, no. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, so, got to keep us updated on the, on, on the experiment here. Yeah, I will. You know, I, I think I'm going to keep it going for a while because it's like, psh, I, I don't really, mi- you know, and, and you can have, like, cheat days every once in a while. I have some pasta or something like yeah. that. But, like... It's not like I really miss anything. Yeah. Like I said, the first two weeks are just like hard. Yeah. <laughs> because you're just like, oh man, I miss carbs so bad. Yeah. <laughs> I want some carbs. Um, but you know, after that, your body just adapts to it. It's really cool. Yeah. I, I mean, if you can stick to it longer than you know for a while, that'd be. I mean, it'd be cool to hear because I think just for me personally, it's like it's pretty hard to maintain like. At like at infinitum, right? I mean, oh, it's no. just like well, it's no, hard no, no. to do when you're like eating out. Like it's totally, totally, totally. Well, yeah, no, no, no. Like you know, I have like Fridays cheat day, right, where okay. I can have carbs or something like that. But in general, try to keep every other day like really low. Cool. Yeah, so it's like I get that little break. So I'm you know, even if I'm like, oh my gosh, so I you're keeping it relatively out. sane. Yeah, 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 yeah. Keep you sane. I think yeah. that's a good because I think a lot of times with like these diets and stuff, when you're trying to lose weight. You just like go really hard and it's hard on your body. And then you're just like, oh man, I can't keep, I don't want to keep doing that. I can't keep doing that. Instead of just like, you know, trying to find a way to adapt your lifestyle to something. Yeah. I think that's like a realistic look. I think that's something that we just discussed a lot in our community. Like, so like, what about these drinks that you got? I was thinking about (laughs) like, you know, uh, ketone drinks. So like, uh, would that, you know, I don't know anything about the weight loss and stuff like that, but like, w- does that help with dieting at all? Do so they, we showed no, in November of 17, so last year, yeah. that this drink, the ketone ester, actually suppresses ghrelin. Uh huh. So, so it like makes you so have it less reduces appetite. appetite. So we showed it actually reduces subjective appetite. Uh, we didn't actually study if that actually translated to weight loss. Yeah, but that would be a natural extension of yeah, that study. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, and the root mechanism is that we believe that beta hydroxybutyrate, the main ketone body, um, essentially suppresses ghrelin. Yeah, so, one I, thing, so that kind of reverse explains why you know, ketogenic it, diets are more we, satiating. Here's the than, thing, and you think about it like even if you know you're you're a professional dieter like you or something. <laughs> I would not say I'm a professional dieter. I know, I know. But <laughs> I'm teasing. I'm teasing. <laughs> like uh, maybe I should describe you as a professional poop eater, and we can talk about that experience <laughs> in a little bit. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> what I mean is, like, we think a lot about food. Yeah. Like all the time, right? Everybody, even somebody who's got like a hold on their diet and food, like you probably do, right? Yeah. I imagine that, like, 
if there's anybody who has control of their diet and the things they put in their body, it's somebody like you. Sure. But you still think about food all the time. Like, I don't even know how many minutes a day, but it's probably a good portion. Mm -hmm. Planning meals, eating meals. And it's like, how do we remove that from our consciousness or like public consciousness? And I think about that with my work in genetic engineering. Like, what happens if we could genetically modify somebody so that they never had to, you know, try to lose weight or think mm. about what they eat or anything like that. Like their metabolism, let's say was perfect, right? With, with this genetic engineering, like would that change society more in, in ways more than just like, uh, you know, people are more attractive and healthy, but like our mindset, cause like we wouldn't have to think about food yeah, so I mean, much. That's an interesting scenario. I mean, hundred percent, I think, if you just free up 20% of like productivity time, uh, that's pretty massive in terms of productivity or GDP, right? Like yeah. you just focus more brain power and neurons towards intellectual work than like your animal instincts. Um, but I think appetite makes sense from an evolutionary perspective, right? Like, you know, just our core reptilian what brains is like hunting What if you get rid of your stuff. appetite, would you? Uh, no, I wouldn't. Um, oh, interesting. But that might be just due to the fact that I feel like I have good discipline around it and good understanding around it. And like maybe I'm scared of the side effects of like just removing like a core instinct, right? Like w would you remove like sexual desire, for example? Like that kind of reminds me of like, like a lot of people think about sex all the time. Like if it, like it, it's like, and, and for like just as important reason as like eating, thinking about food all the time, it's like how to pass on and survive and your, your genetic material, right? At well, a very you could core still level. still enjoy it, but you just like, you never get really hungry. Yeah. Or like if you get never like have to think about, like I know, I, you know, if you, you just, just be lonely, like, oh, I got, I got some time now, like I'll eat some food or something. Right. Which is, I think like just altering such a core part of a human experience is would make us not human anymore are you no, I, I'm, not, I'm not worried about that i think it's just like wait, I, I, are, I, you, I, are you afraid to not be human <laughs> no i think i i think there's a lot of side effects to think about before you like just remove a core drive right it's like to me it's like as impact was removing like sexual drive yeah like no, would you uh, remove sexual drive i think it's a very similar <laughs> argument right like I, I, like not I, having I, any appetite is like similar to like okay if you just like straight up didn't want to have sex and like didn't have like the desire for that and like that would give you productivity, that would save you a lot of energy. I think that would be more harmful to my sexual partners than me. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> they'd be like, damn, you like never want to have sex or anything like that. And you're like, yeah, well, you know, I can just decide. Uh, but as a as a, a person, if I was like single and didn't have anything, I don't know. Sometimes, you know, sex, sexual cravings do get in like the way of just wanting to get stuff done, be yeah. a normal human being. Exactly. So like <laughs> I, I would have to think about if I would want to remove my own sexual are, drive. Are you, uh, like in the same way, like I would have to think what about What happens if, if you could evolve appetite. beyond what you are now? Would you be into that? So, you know, go into the stuff Like a transhumanism, like if- Not transhumanism. That okay. stuff's a little weird. I don't know. I'm just saying like genetically, right? Like- are you against, say, all genetic modifications of yourself? Like, say, what what happens if, uh, like, you could get genetically modified safely and, you know, everything, there's no side effects or anything like that, and it would make you, say, I don't know, perform better as an athlete? Yeah. That is a lot more interesting to me. Yeah? Yeah. I so mean, like, I, obviously, the caveats of, like, I'm not going to get cancer, you're yeah, not yeah, going to, yeah. like... But you're not Fuck against. Up. I just want you're not against. No, no, there's no. no ethical, moral, religious qualms around manipulating, you know, biological material. So to me, it's just like I think there's like interesting side effects to think about uh, in terms of like appetite. To me, it's like again, like do I want to remove my sexual drive? Yeah. So I got a question here, um, which is interesting. Maybe not. Maybe. And like, yeah, maybe you it, have like our, par our sexual partners would be like, uh, <laughs> you know, are you asexual? Are you, are you trying to tell us that you're asexual here? <laughs> That'd be the biggest problem, right? Yeah. <laughs> Your girlfriend just being like, oh, but I got a question and it may be too deep, but like, and I think about this a lot, you know, people who do stuff like that, that you do, like, why do you do what you do? Maybe people don't ask you that question enough or maybe they do, but it's something I'm interested in. Why do you do what you do? Like, you know, because 
it seems like, and even talking to you, I think you've mentioned some stuff before that it's like hard, you know, to like, you do all these different sure. experiments, yeah. you push your body to the limit and peak all the time. So like, why do you do all this stuff? I'm interested. Yeah. Okay. And I'm curious to hear your answer around, you know, a lot of the, you know, the biohacking and genetic engineering that you do with your stuff as well. Um, so I can start. I think self-reflection and self-understanding is one of the, it is probably like one of the most underrated things. I think a lot of people are not very self-aware. I don't think people think about like improving themselves. So I think if one is on the path of analyzing themselves, then one is just open to the fact that there's like areas that you want to improve or areas that you want to like edit of yourself. And I think my drive towards improving my habits, my lifestyle is that, um, does it focus? It's kind of like maximizing like my enjoyment in my my time and my does it, capacity does it on this planet. Focus like mostly on the physical side, or do you also do a lot of stuff on like mental or just like uh, you know like oh man you know sometimes you know I I work a lot on mental stuff way more than physical. And I'll be like oh man sometimes I get like angry too much about something like this. I'm gonna try to fix that. Yeah, so I, I think mental angry. is probably less spoken about because it's less obvious yeah but i would say mental is more important to me than physical oh yeah yeah i mean i think i care about physical in the sense that i care about living longer and being healthier right like we are physical beings like like our hardware you know is important for our software our, our cognition to actually work so i care like i'm not trying to be a super athlete like i know i'm never going to be a super athlete yeah but i care about improving like the machinery of my biology so i can have more stamina, more endurance, you know, better cardiovascular health. So that, that's kind of my interest in, 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 in performance. I know other people in our community or other colleagues are like really, you know, targeting like, you know, very fast marathon times or trying to win, break yeah. world records, right? I think there are definitely people that are trying to just be the best if, of a physical specimen. But I think for me, it's mainly physical on the longevity side. But I think, yeah, what's important, I think, especially for both our work is being sharp Cognitively, yeah, I guess a lot of your products do have are. are I mean, that's where we started. We, we cared about cognition first. Cause that's the only thing that's like very interesting from us as humans, yeah. right? So I think one thing that I've thought about a lot in terms of just like cognitive health that is like somewhat applicable for everyone is that, um, like the inputs into our brain are so important. In the sense that, like, I think most of us are seeing the same information sources. Like, all of us are on like Twitter, Facebook. We get the same like, I don't know, CNN or Fox News alerts. And to me, that's making the same neuron pathways firing for everyone. And the end the way that I wanted to counter that was I wanted to read information sources or books that were very different from what everyone else is reading so I could be more creative. Like right? that's like kind of like the core thesis, right? If oh, everyone's yeah, seeing the same sure. inputs into your brain, you're gonna have the no, same kind of I, patterns. I totally agree. So yeah. I wanna read like off the path books, read other things and just try to just populate my brain with other ideas. It's like the one thing that I've figured, well, maybe I haven't figured it out, but the one thing I've kind of figured out in you know, running my company and doing science and all these things is that when everybody thinks the same way and there isn't a good reason, think the opposite. Right. <laughs> or when everybody's doing something a certain way and there's not a good reason, see what happens when you do the opposite. Yeah. And it's led to so many interesting outcomes because like people tend to just do stuff because of dogma or because that's the way it's always been, or that's the easiest way to do this thing. And that usually doesn't lead to interesting things. And when you kind of break off from that, like you said, start to experience different things than people normally experience. I, you know, that's why like online, I try to broaden my online community. So like I purposefully try to keep myself out of an echo chamber and will follow or seek out people who are just completely different yeah. from me, totally completely different and see, and see what, you know, and, and these people are smart. That's the thing that people would say, like, you know, somebody who is, who believes, 
you know, vaccines cause autism, they can cite you scientific papers, right, that are published right. that back up the things that they're saying. Right. Just like people who say vaccines don't cause autism can't. And and it's like really interesting, especially from the idea that people think the other side is stupid or whatever, because they're not. And and these different ideas, if you can just understand them and comprehend them, I think not only does it lead to way more love and understanding <laughs> among people, yeah. but it also leads to like completely interesting creative ideas because you can see you can hold two contradictory ideas in your brain at the same time and see what comes out of that. Yeah, and most I, people can't. Yeah, most I, people can't I, do I think, that. Yeah, I think that's hitting some sort of core truth. I think people can extract like logical steps. It's like their axioms might be different, right? Like, okay, find what assumptions that they're making that are different that leads them to that like very opposite conclusion. Yeah. So I'm curious to like spin the, the mic back like to you, like what makes you do your experimentation like i know that if like you think diet is like interesting or, or hardcore i mean like some of your exploits around you know completely replacing your microbiome or like you know genetically and trying to you know you know uh, alter like a, like a muscle uh muscle proteins that i would say is even more hardcore than you know, anything <laughs> that i'm doing which is like <laughs> see like that, I, I think i, no, I think that I, like that's that just like something that like you just that stuff is like put in. 90 percent mental and then like, you know, 10% experiment, whereas yours is probably like, you know, I don't know, 50% experiment or 60% yeah. experiment and 40% like devising the experiment. Sure. So it's like, it takes a lot more out of you to do your stuff physically because you have to do it. Whereas me, it's like all the work is beforehand and then the end is just like injecting yourself. Yeah. Obviously, you know, some stuff is a, a bit harder and takes more yeah. out of you, but like it's... uh. I think if you understand it on a certain level, you know, it's like people who skydive, right? Like I would never skydive. Like I just don't even <laughs> think it's a good idea at all. Not into it. You know, I don't I see I haven't it. tried it, but I I'd, I'd be open to it. Yeah. But, but I I hear you. It's just like I I see no positive outcome for myself, right? right? You get like terif you get terrified, terrified and like you might have like a 0.001% chance of dying. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but like people who do it all the time and understand it and understand, you know, the chance of dying and, and stuff like that, like to them, it's not such a big deal, right. right? Because their level of knowledge on the subject is in depth. And that's the way I try to approach things. And the reason I do these experiments, I, I think mainly stems from just innate curiosity. Yeah. Um, and I don't know where necessarily it comes from, but I'm just like curious about everything. Curious about people. Curious about, like sometimes I'll go on like Facebook, just some random person I don't even know. Not like a famous CEO or anybody like that. Just right. like a person who works at Walmart in like a town you never heard of in New Mexico and just like read through the profile because it's so interesting. They're just like such an interesting person yeah. because there's something so different and unique about them. And like finding that unique thing is so hard in this world because there's so much, like we just talked about, so much, uh, you know, sameness everywhere. Right. Like we all have the same point of view. We all read the same stuff. We all, you know, see the same movies. And uh, I think that leads to a lot of just same thinking. And, uh, the curiosity drives me to explore new things and think differently and find so how does new that, things. I mean, so like if you're so like you could explore infinite things, but obviously you've explored a lot of how you can genetically engineer yeah, so to explored, democratize these technologies. Yeah, right? I've so I've explored like, a lot with biology and so genetic engineering. How did it how did it focus how did yeah, that curiosity you know, focus? It's, it's interesting because I started out in computers. So you know when I was 18 or 19, I got a job at Motor. You started out in computers also, yeah, didn't you? I'm, yeah, I have a computer science degree from Stanford. Yeah, yeah. 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 So uh, I you know, worked at Motorola when I was like 18, doing some computer networking stuff. Like and a high school intern? I mean, that's pretty young. No, I got a job. They actually, this was back at, you know, I'm old. This is back in during, the, right before the dot-com bubble burst where they were oh, just, wow. you know, like, they are just like, oh, man. Any, everybody gets jobs. Everybody gets money, right? Dot com bubble was yeah. crazy. Yeah, and I was eighteen, and they just hired me on as like you know a full time network engineer. Holy shit! Yeah, it was crazy. Um, 
But then the dot com bubble burst and they like laid off a hundred thousand people. Of course, oh, I had like the least seniority and was the youngest. So they're just like, you're gone. But uh, it was that kind of like ability to control things or like build things, right? Yeah. With computers like programming or building networks or something like that build things on this like fundamental level that always fascinated me. And that's how I got into like genetic engineering and biology is, you know, manipulating things on some sort of fundamental level. I wanted to be able to do that. And now I, you know, I know how limited all this stuff is, even though I, I still, we, we still can with genetic engineering manipulate stuff. It's just so much more complex than I ever imagined. Um, yeah. So much more complex, but it's fun. Uh, it's fun manipulating biology, but yeah, I think it's 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 really a curiosity thing. I think if I couldn't do bi- biology or biological engineering or genetic engineering or anything like that, I I think I would find something else. One thing I'm really fascinated with right now is uh, I know this sounds stupid and silly and probably off topic, but like documentaries and like filmmaking and stuff like that. I, I don't know why I've just really gotten into it lately. I I don't think it's that off base in the sense that perhaps you're sensing something that like I think we're sensing at HVMN is that a lot of our work is just storytelling and educating people. It is the truth, right? right? And it's like it's storytelling. It's, and, and and I think maybe that's like like where that that interest comes from. Where like I think your work with like democratizing you know getting like like genetic engineering to people like that 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 side of biohacking is very much just educating people right like i've oh, seen totally i mean we've been in a lot of conferences together i've seen you just like talk about like the mission of the odin yeah getting these tools out there getting educating people that it's not you know something that you need a phd totally. in an academic center although you have a PhD and you, you have an academic background um but you can you know uh, like just like how computer programming or computer hacking was democratized. Now you don't, you can just, you know, code something when you're 12. Oh man. I love this see a future where you can do biological engineering when you're 12 too. Yeah. I love this whole storytelling thing. And to get into that, like, oh man, it's just so fascinating. It's been so fascinating to me for just a while now, just how to tell good stories to people. Because if you look at like social media and everybody uses social media, everybody's trying to tell a story, right? Like everybody, even if you're not trying to tell a story, like the posts you make are trying to tell a story about who you are or whatever you're trying to promote or whatever. And maybe you're like a funny person. So you like, you know, have these funny Facebook posts all the time or, or a meme person. So you share memes or maybe you're like a science person. So you share like lots of science articles or whatever, right. but like it's telling this story about you. And we don't think too much about that, that like we're creating a story. And I've just thought so much about that, like how to tell the good story, how to be that person, that character, like in the story and like make that story. And it's just, it's so fascinating. And I, I would say that, you know, you are in in the sense of storytelling are are playing that role, right? Like I think just oh, the the, to, sure. the like zoom <laughs> I mean, out for people that aren't aware are, of right? Josiah's background. I mean, I, I would say that you know you've been cited in you know New York Times, Atlantic as oh yeah, they one of the most prominent prominent biohackers. I don't know. They just love me in the media, and it's because like I think it's because I am kind of that like cliche, right? Like oh man, he's got like crazy hair and he like looks crazy and all this stuff. It's funny because in the New York Times, I don't know if you you heard, but like, you know, everybody else that they mentioned in the article, they- They used know, doctor, right? I yeah, don't with, yeah. And they didn't use it for me. And this has been a constant problem. I just had somebody who I was in a documentary for and they're like, what, what do you want your byline to be or something like that? Or here's the byline we're going to use for you. And it was just like Josiah Zane or biohacker or something. And I was like, you know, it's like, I have a PhD. You can put that. It's, it's cool to put that. Yeah. <laughs> but people like to portray me as this rogue guy who's just doing stuff and, and all the, all these things. And that's cool. Like whatever, whatever yeah. sells the paper or something like that. But some kind of times it is a little bit annoying because it's like, Hey, look, like I'm not just this like rogue crazy guy. Like <laughs> I'm also a human being. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I think that's like something I wanted to talk about. Like, why? I mean, do you do feel you, like you're portrayed in the media as like somebody? 
I think like it, it evolves you know, a little. I think it has evolved. San Francisco, Silicon Valley, startup guy, stamp like yeah, doing you know, like, biohacker shit. Yeah, like yeah. doing like starving themselves when they're fasting, exactly. or doing like weird, <laughs> exactly. like pseudo legitimate like things that you consume. And I, I think I think we we had talked about this. I think. In the beginning, I think we leaned into that image to build up momentum. Totally. And I think, you know, I think the media is using us a little bit to like play their character they want to tell, oh, totally. right? It's like we're playing uh, each other, right? And I think it's like okay, like they get like a Stanford educated computer science dude like talking about applying engineering towards biology and like wanting to live forever and live longer and make themselves smarter. Great story. That's gonna like sell some papers, get some clicks. We're gonna like use that story. And I think probably for you, like I think. Yeah, like the crazy dyed hair, like kind of crazy. You, yeah, you don't yeah. you don't seem like an academic, right? You, you don't come off as like a PhD bio nerd. Oh no, so many times it's so funny. I I was, I was invited to uh, it was uh, what was it? It was a computer science conference yeah. in Utah, <clears throat> you know, and they invited me to give a talk and everything like that. And I remember showing up at the conference. And, you know, we we'll arrive at the hotel and there's this other person who's obviously there for the conference. Right. You know, they just have that look. And I'm just like, you know, oh, oh, you know, like, do you know where we uh, register or something like that? And he's like, I think you have me mistaken for some somebody else. Like, he's like, I, you know, I, I'm probably not going to what you're going to or something like yeah. that. And I'm like, are you going to this computer conferencing? Yeah. He's like, Oh yeah, I am, and I'm like, yeah, me too. I'm gonna give a talk or something. Like that. Yeah. He was like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, yeah, I, I have a PhD and stuff, and like, you know, they invited me, they paid for every. <laughs> it's just so funny because people don't see me like that, which is kind of sad, but and it's also just the way the world works to a yeah. certain extent. But um, I think you enjoy it, like, like I think to a certain I, extent I think you, you enjoy do, it. right? Yeah, to a certain extent, I do. It's right. it's that whole like. Trying to, like we talked about at the beginning, be different or doing different things, right? Do you think you could do your mission better if you played more by the book? Probably. I think a lot. So here's a like, story. Why don't you do that? I'm actually curious. Like, I think it's like, I mean, I think I would say that for, I, like, I I, for myself, little, I think I've, we are becoming more serious as we have more and more momentum and more and more serious customers, I, right? I have like cleaned up a bit and like, I try not to curse as much anymore and all these other things. <laughs> yeah. uh, but I remember story. So origi- this was like two years ago or, you know, when I was trying to get the company off the ground and I got an interview at Y Combinator. Okay. So that's like the most prestigious startup incubator. Yeah. It, and probably yeah, yeah. anywhere. And uh, I show up and I show up just like absolutely looking like, I'm homeless. <laughs> you know, not only that, you know, at the time I had like more piercings and my hair was probably blue or something. And uh, I walk in and I just like, you know, with some engineer at the time we were working on engineering brewing yeast, okay. you know, to make a product for people where they could engineer brewing yeast, genetic, genetically engineer brewing yeast to do different things. And one of them was glow. Okay. So I just brought in these, you know, you know, plates of brewing yeast and just like tossed them out to everybody. I'm like, and sit down, and they were just like, what the fuck just happened? They're just like looking at me like, who is this person who just <laughs> walked out, in? like random Petri dishes of like sketchy like stuff, right? <laughs> and they're just like, uh, what? And they didn't know even where to start with yeah. me. And I was just kind of, you know, sitting there with like a big grin on my face like, yeah, I got this, you know? And like our company, you know, that's when we were first starting to do well and stuff like that and yeah. make money and, you know, things were developing new products. But it was just like, I was so different, I think, than what they think a good founder is right. or anything like that, that like I didn't even have a chance. Right. And that's, it's true because like we connect with people who are like us. Sure. Right. Yeah. When there's people who aren't like us, and this is part part of like you know where racism stem, stems from, when there's people who aren't like us, we're, we're fearful of them sometimes. Yeah. And it took me a while to realize that that like sometimes being different like pushes people away. So I've tried to like find a good balance of like being able to be who I want to be, but also like not to 
you know, freak people out. Like, yeah. oh, this guy is just like some mad scientist. Genius totally. Cooking, like, because, you know, there's like no something. reason to do that. Yeah. Like, and so it's like my, the way I look and my image and the way I act, it started to slowly, you know, move more towards the norm because I want, I don't want to lose opportunities and I don't want to like, um, there are a lot of interesting people that I don't want to scare away or that I want to enjoy right. people in general that I want to enjoy. Right. So it's, it's, a, uh, you know, I think it's, I mean, the way I, I mean, I think it is like a, a kind of an ev- interesting journey where I think you gain access to a lot of people because you're interesting. No. Right. Totally. So, so it's like, how do you totally. get the best of both worlds? Cause exactly. I think I, that's something I've realized, right? Like where people know you for, being this crazy genetic engineer guy who's been like injecting himself with stuff. But on the other hand, it's like, (laughs) you know, I get, I get both types of people, people who want to hang out with me because I'm interesting, but also people who don't want to hang out with me. Cause you're like, Oh, this guy's crazy. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So it's like finding that balance. That's really, that's really good. And you know, it's starting to work now, right? As I become more towards more people reach out to me, more people are want to spend time with me and hang out with me and like be around me. And it's, I think I think I have a good balance now. Yeah, I mean, this is my impression, given like where your product and, and your technology is going towards. But it sounded like a lot of the focus, perhaps earlier, was like, I guess not. I guess more in your experimentation was like on yourself, yeah, like totally. replacing your own microbiome or like you know trying to genetically engineer your your own muscle. Yeah, and now you're moving towards you know, I got like I think I don't know if it's announced, but like you're moving towards like. Uh, you know, genetically engineering other things. Yeah, animals and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah no. Uh, we so have, is that like, so is that part of like, the progression? Like you're, instead of like telling people that, hey, like we should all just inject ourselves with- Well, here's the thing, Jeff. With CRISPR. You know what I came to the realization of? So when I was like working on genetically modifying myself or doing these experiments with the bacteria, my microbiome to like right. help with my gut health. And this um, is when you ate someone else's poop. I ate somebody's poop. <laughs> <laughs> they got to close that poop Keep, eating reference. Oh, yeah, yeah. You just don't want to yeah. do this weird <laughs> reference. Yeah. <laughs> and I realized that, like, this <laughs> this doesn't scale, right? Yeah. Like, every single person can't, like, do genetic engineering, learn how to do it, and inject themselves with something where, where they're, they know what it is and they're doing it properly. Right. Every person can't you know, find somebody who's a healthy donor of poop to help modify their gut microbiome so that they become healthy. And that was a huge realization to me. Is that like- From a business you, perspective or like a storytelling perspective? No, just from a human perspective, okay. right? Like if you are, let's say your, you know, your product, you know, these bottles or whatever, your your products, you're packing them by hand, right? right? You're doing it all by yourself. And you're like, oh man, how are we going to get this to a million people, right? They can't I, do it. I think this is yeah. going to help people. How do we get it to a million people? You're like, you can't. And when you're like, every single person who uses this needs to know how it works with genetic engineering, right? Yeah. They need to know how to purify it. They need to know how to make it well. They need to know how to inject it properly. They need to know all this stuff. You're like, that doesn't. that's not going to scale. Yeah. Like everybody doesn't have the time to learn all these things. So how do we make stuff that scales, how do we, because the FDA, right, it wants to shut down or like regulate this stuff pretty heavily. So how do we develop a system that scales, but can also be somewhat safe or something like that? Right. Safer than just somebody doing some random drugs, right. random injections. And that's really what I've been trying to, to focus on and understand because it's like, that's how you... I'm, I don't want to, you know, change the world necessarily or anything like that, but I wouldn't mind reaching a large number of people. Yeah. And the only way to reach people is to make things accessible, make things easier, make things right. more safe, make things FDA compliant. All exactly. That stuff. Yeah. Or if not FDA compliant, just like some way that they can't target you. Right. And so we were trying to figure that out. If we want human genetic engineering to be a thing, cosmetic or just non-health related human genetic right. engineering, how do we get this stuff into the hands of people? Yeah. How do we teach people about this stuff? So as a layman and help our audience here, 
what is the current status quo for genetic engineering? Can you like at a high level describe like the steps that like you mentioned, like purification, inject, like, like, oh, can, yeah, you, can, no, can, can mean, we just go through like the genetic engineering biohacker guide 101? Well, like, so the hardest what are the, thing, kind of the steps or like the things saying, that you kind of need? It's like, if you're trying, you know, if you, if you're trying to devise a whole new, uh, you know, supplement or w w whatever yeah. it, enhance, enhancement, I don't, I don't know what you call them because they're not all nootropics. What do you guys call them now? Uh, yeah, I mean, we some some are supplements, some yeah, are so, foods. Yeah. yeah, food supplements. When you're trying to design something new, you know, that's when you get the scientists or people like, that's the hardest part, is like, if you want to genetically engineer yourself and understand what you're trying to genetically engineer, the hardest part is figuring out, you know, the DNA sequences to put in your body or mm -hmm. put in your cells and things like that. After that, it's... I don't want to say easy, but relatively easy. Nowadays, you can order the DNA online or something like that. You can have somebody do the purification and everything, um, and then basically just inject it in yourself. But the hardest part is the design part. So it's like it's like programming, right? Yeah. What you need is like an app store for DNA, right? Um, and some way to show that it works, some way to test it, and the way to test it, like the prototyping system has to be living because you can't really test and see if this DNA is going to make your muscles grow on something that doesn't have muscles, right? right? right. So like bacteria and yeast and all these single-celled organisms are out. Yeah. You need animals, you need an animal model, you need one that's easy to work with, not illegal to work with, right. um, you know, it isn't regulated or anything like that. And we came upon frogs, Um and what a lot of people probably don't know or think about is that human DNA or the DNA that you'd use to genetically modify yourself also works in frogs. Hmm. Um, really? Despite their DNA being different, all the elements and a lot of the proteins are similar enough. So that, what was that? What was the muscle growing, uh, I guess, sequence yeah, so, that you were injecting yeah, yourself? Yeah. And we'll, we'll, I'll get to that in one okay, sec. Okay. So like, yeah. So like if you want to do an experiment or prototype a gene therapy on yourself, you could do from the time you order the DNA to till the time you get results from say f frogs or like you know a bunch of frogs, probably be about two months, huh. right? Maybe three months, but two months. And you're talking frogs are so easy to keep, so easy to use, everything like that, right? right. They take zero effort and they're so inexpensive that it's great. So say, you know, when I genetically or attempted to genetically modify myself, I was trying to, you know, this gene myostatin, right. which controls muscle growth. Well, what you can do is, and we recently got the DNA to test this, um, to take this gene that inhibits this myostatin gene, it's called folostatin, and make your cells or your body produce lots of it through a gene therapy, Right. Well, you got two options. You could test this on yourself without, you know, knowing if it works, which, you know, it's, there, there should be no reason that you have to test stuff on yourself unsafely, right? right? And I hate to test stuff on animals, but you're, you're usually with these gene therapies, you're not harming them, right? So usually when you give them these gene therapies, their muscles might grow, but they're not dying. They're not getting cancer. You're, you know, giving them anesthetics. So they really don't feel anything. All they're doing is getting bigger muscles, but it's an amazing opportunity to learn how the gene therapy works, test it and see if it works, provide people a platform if they want to test other stuff so that, to see if that works and just like spread this, this stuff around. Um, I think it's, it's amazing because think about if anybody could genetically or knew how to genetically modify animals. Right. It sounds just crazy and wacky, but like, you are essentially are an animal, right? So if you could we do it animals. with if you could do it with a frog, you can apply the same principles to yourself. Right. Whether, you know, that's the correct way to do it or not the correct way to do it, I think it's moving towards a reasonable path. So that's a, that would be interesting to compare with academia. So it sounds like the very it's like the same techniques, right? Exactly like, the same. So what you're saying is that you can Probably do the safer. same things in an academic context. But I guess you kind of skip like the in like the IRB, the Ethic Review Committee. You skip like the publication stuff, but you have like the animal model. You can order the same genetic, like the, I guess the gen gene therapy to the same DNA sequences. 
and just do do it yourself, it's right? It's all the same. Yeah, it's all the same. Usually, you, I mean, you should see the research that goes on with animals by academics, and I'm not like harshing them or anything, but like they're pretty brutal. Yeah, and like their got protocols and techniques are not developed to like you know, make sure the animal doesn't get hurt or like be kind to the animal or things like that. And you could like help develop these things, right? right? And also a lot of the work they do is with mice. And mice, I think, are like, they're all we have. I think the the reason that scientists chose mice because they're like, what animal can we experiment on that nobody will be against, right? right? They're like, dogs, that's out. Cats, no. Horses, no. They're like, people kind of hate rats. Let's do like rats and mice. Let's experiment on them. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Nobody yeah. will be against it. Yeah. And they do. And they're not really, you know, the greatest organism. They're like really hard to keep. You think frogs are actually a better model? Oh, I think, well, oh man, if you want to get into like the DNA and immune systems and stuff like that, and the fact that they're like, uh, you know, cold blooded instead of warm blooded, right, there right. are some differences definitely. But like, if you're talking about scale, here's the thing. If you wanted to do an experiment on a hundred mice, like, it would be epic. Yeah. Right? Pretty epic experiment. I mean, I've, I've visited labs. Like, one of my friends, you know, Sumit, does a lot of rat experiments. And it's like, you literally are, have, like, hundreds of rat cages and feeding them. And Yeah, I mean, and rats could be big, right? Yeah. Like, that big. And you got to house a hundred of those. a pretty big rat, but yeah. Right? Yeah. And uh, you think about frogs that are, like, you know, this big, right? Right. They don't require much upkeep it all. You feed them some crickets or something like that, and that's it. They survive just fine, right? At, at just normal yeah. whatever temperatures. You can house hundreds easily, right? Yeah. Probably in, I'm not saying you should, you know, in a cage like this, this big. Yeah. Right? But I guess the argument is that like, okay, a rat model is going to be closer to humans because uh, they're I mean, they're, Here's mammals. the thing that people don't know, right? Is like, when you are doing, trying to get FDA approval with mice yeah. and stuff like that. You can't use normal mice. Yeah, they're all like genetically... In, yeah, they're genetically added, modified yeah. to be humanized right. because they're just such... Mice are such a terrible representation of humans right. that they actually have to put a bunch of human genes and stuff into mice right. to make them more like humans. Right. <laughs> to make them, you know... Better human models, sure. Yeah. And it's like... Uh, I get it, but if, if we're just looking at things purely on a genetic level, right... Purely like, can I make this muscle grow bigger? Right. The difference between mice and frogs is virtually negligible. And the right? difference, okay. There's like I see what nothing, you're, saying. you're not going to get any better results from a mouse than you would from a frog. Right. Or for like, the, the first uh, product we're going to release is using this IGF-1 gene therapy. I'm sure you heard okay. IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor yep. one. It's a gene that just causes growth. Yes. In humans during puberty, it's a, expressed a lot and it right. causes growth hormone right. you know to be made in the body right. and it causes you to you know grow and right. go through puberty. But so, on the flip side it also is like a cancer it's it's also implicated in cancer. Yes, that's a really we could get into a yeah. whole discussion. You know, I've tried to figure out because there's a lot of things that are like associated with cancer, but do they actually cause sure. cancer? That's a whole mess okay. Okay. and stuff like that. Yeah. No. But and this is the first experiment we did with these animals because we thought it'd be really simple, right? Like you know, they give cows growth hormones, yeah. right? So then they get more meat and stuff like that. Yeah. Compared to the cows that don't have growth hormone, even though they eat the same amount, yeah. we thought, let's just do the same experiment. Let's like inject some of these frogs with this gene therapy, that, right? That increases IGF-1 production. Yeah, it, it, it makes a lot of IGF-1. Yeah. And if it works, the frogs will get bigger yeah. than the ones who didn't. And it totally worked. Like, Really? We got some frogs that just grew like, almost twofold and they're just compared to the other frogs you're like whoa that there's one frog we call thick boy because he just got so big <laughs> that's so pretty big. awesome so okay uh, so yeah so we grew do, fuck like huge ass we frogs. did a huge experiment on a bunch of frogs you know like 20 something frogs just as a you know just to see what would happen and it just it worked Work. phenomenally whoa yeah. Um, Can you help describe some of the steps? You're like, you know, like uh, I, this will be productized, but like, yeah. what are the steps? Like, like help help me like visualize like what I you mean, did. I mean, it's not too complicated, yeah. right? Because you, you're generally getting everything 
you know, handed to you. Right. So you're getting the DNA mixed with, you know, the solution to inject it with. So you so order that, like, you, or like you can order it through you know, the yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, okay, so I just want IGF one. Basically, what you do is you take the frog, anesthetize it. Yeah. So you just put it in this solution. You could actually fun it. Funny, you could actually anesthetize frogs with like five percent alcohol, like you know, vodka or something. <laughs> yeah. No, they will get drunk and they'll pass out. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this is like old school, but yeah. normally we use this other molecule called benzocaine. Okay. Um, knocks them out, and you just take a syringe and you inject it in the muscle or you inject it in the body, right? And, and uh, this DNA sequence, what inhibits, like, like inhibit or blocks inhibitor for IGF 1? Or just no, this is actually just IGF 1. It's actually human IGF 1. It's like a gene that makes IGF 1. Yeah, it's and just it a gene that just makes more IGF 1. Human IGF-1. How is it like, I guess, what's the vector that bind it in to the... So it's just like DNA. So the DNA, when you inject it, yeah. there's some chemicals mixed in it, and the DNA just goes inside the cell. Yeah. The cells think it's its own DNA. And it just starts replicating And it. just starts using it, right? Okay. They make a bunch of this IGF-1, and then, you know, the frogs make a bunch of growth hormone. And it's not like, you don't even use anything like CRISPR or anything. To no, like no, 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 no. This is just this like is IGF-1 simple. DNA material. Exactly. And it gets absorbed into the cell membrane. Putting in a bunch of extra IGF-1 copies in the cells, right? That works. Yeah, and it works. And uh, it's basically just an injection. That's it. I mean, this is what gene therapies are. Most yeah. modern gene therapies are basically just an injection. I didn't know it was that simple, like or like that conceptually simple. Like you literally just like, jam and extra DNA sequences and like the body's uh, protein synthesis ma ma machinery just starts totally. pumping them out. Exactly, yeah. It, you, you, it's it's an interesting form of like hacking. Yeah. You like trick the cell into thinking this DNA is its own by putting right. in certain DNA sequences right. in there. But it thinks it's its own. It's like, hey, oh, I found this new piece of DNA. Uh, it looks like, you know, it like reads it and it's like, it looks correct. I'm just going to use it. Doesn't ask any questions. It just uses it. Huh. Yeah. Interesting. So I guess help me. I mean, this is actually I'm, I'm actually interested. Like, how does that differ from like the big hoopla around you know CRISPR Cas9? Like, so CRISPR, this this like you know embeds it into the into the sequence. Or so replace, there's a lot of hype about genome editing and genome yeah. engineering, but normally as an adult, you probably aren't going to want to edit your genes, right? There are a few cases in which you'd want to, right? Um, but you don't need permanent modifications, right? If, if you inject some DNA into yourself and it causes a spike in growth hormone over a period of time, right? That's probably what you want. At, and then it goes away. Yeah. That's exactly what you want. Or if you're a doping athlete, call me. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> right? You, you can inject the gene into your body, causes your muscles to grow or, or something, causes yeah. your, your body to grow, and then it just goes away. Yeah. And like, you can't even detect it. Yep. It's just like, the thing is, is that normal people might already have this, right? Normal people, athletes, some athletes might have DNA sequences that causes, say, overexpression of folostatin or right. IGF-1 or VEGF or EPO right. or something like that naturally in their body, right? Right. So they're already at a competitive advantage. Right. So it's interesting to think that you could just like temporarily add in genes to your body and cells that help you compete. Right. So I guess the biggest difference is that is like, Editing your existing DNA, which is like a permanent change, but it's like a big question around like how do you make all your cells? It's this, so hard it's, to get it to work, and it's really it's it's just it's not efficient because it's like one percent efficient. So right. if I try to like edit my cells, it's like one percent or less efficient. I see. If you try to add DNA, it's highly. You're talking like 20, 30 percent, sometimes more efficient. So the DNA is getting into so many cells. That makes sense, right? It works pretty robustly. In adults, obviously, it's it's a little bit more difficult than somebody who's growing, right? right. An adolescent. And or I guess there's also like recent news where there's more side effects or like basically or, CRISPR like gene editing. Yeah, is, yeah, no. uh, having like, it's basically missing targets. As far as we know, with just injecting DNA or something like that, that's the most efficient, actually, way. The and safest, it's like the old school way. The safest way. Yeah, the old school way. The safest, most efficient, like way to do gene hmm. therapy. I guess why is that so much hype on CRISPR then? Uh, be, it's it's as a scientific tool, it's really amazing, okay. right? Because like I can edit, or like as a tool for like plants or something like that, I can edit a plant when it's like a seed or an embryo. Right. And then the plants have, have those traits for forever, right? 
or like for cattle or livestock, I can engineer a cattle to have more meat, right? And then all its offspring also does. Right. Um, whereas on adults, right? Generally, we have our body plan mostly mostly there, so right. we don't really want to edit. Well, that's, but you can make the argument for like something like sickle cell anemia. No, or like these totally. are genetic disease. That then that there's application there, right? Totally. Right. Yes. No, I'm not saying that there's not any application. I'm saying for the majority of cases that people would want to genetically modify themselves. Right. It wouldn't be the the one of choice. Okay. Right? It would be more like if you wanted to genetically modify your embryo so that it didn't have a disease that yeah. you were susceptible to or something like that. Yeah, then that you'd sense. want to use CRISPR. Yeah. But as an adult, you'd want to use this other you know, gene therapy technique, which is just basically injecting DNA. It doesn't have a lot of hype just because like, uh, it's, it's not nothing exciting. It's basically just literally injecting DNA. There's yeah. a lot of clinical trials use this a lot of like, you know, science experiments use this. So it's totally legit. Yeah. It's like, something people have used and done. And, uh, you know, with our stuff, we, we show it can work. So yeah. the next and there's step- an existing therapeutics, existing drugs that, you, that are basically injecting DNA sequences. To- there's none that's approved. So there's only actually one gene therapy that is approved. Okay. It actually uses a virus to get the DNA in. It's for a congenital form of blindness, mm. right? So there's no gene therapies approved that use this technique, but there's only one gene therapy approved in the U.S. in general. So I don't think that's like... A lot of people use viruses to get genes into their cells because viruses help the genes get in much better. The I viruses see. don't replicate. They just they have all the stuff taken out to replicate. They just infect cells. Right. So viruses probably infect at a rate much, much higher than just injecting DNA. You're probably talking, I don't know, 50, 60, 75% infection rate getting the dna into cells the problem with viruses is your body develops immunity to them okay antibodies to kill them so like if you get a viral gene therapy the chances that you can get another one and it'll actually work are not high they actually screen people going into clinical trials to see if they have the antibodies to these viruses because (laughs) they know if those people have the antibodies sometimes you have them naturally right then they won't allow you in the clinical trial and there's just so many just there's like a limited set of viral vectors exactly. that have their like different antigens. Theoretically, you could try to always make a new one or something yeah. like that. But like DNA, uh, you know, DNA can be immunogenic, but generally it's not, right? There's generally not antibodies that will... That attack DNA, yeah. sure. <clears throat> right? You can imagine why, because we, you know, our bodies it have... It kill itself, right? Yeah. So it's such a great... And a lot of viruses are RNA-based viruses, so our bodies rather attack RNA than DNA or something. So, like, it's it's not immunogenic. It works great, you know, or it works okay, good enough that, you know, you could do multiple injections or huh. something. It probably still works. I have su- I, I I mean, I just, this is not my wheelhouse, but I'm surprised there's only one gen- FDA approved genetic therapy. I, it just seemed like there's been in the news and like oh been man, discussed. there's thousands and thousands. You know what? And like so many I mean, trials, are like this gene therapy works, and it's like so. I'm just surprised there's only one. Is it actually just like so? There's only one gene. So if therapy. you want to talk about how the FDA works, you know, and I, it's my new mission is to like f- bring down the FDA <laughs> 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 or figure out a way around them. Yeah, the FDA works like this. Their job is to make drugs that can help the most amount of people while hurting the least amount of people and make companies money, right? If it doesn't fit those three things, it like, it doesn't matter, right? Okay. I if mean, you the first a, two points are legit, right? Well, well, the people making the drugs are companies, right? right? They're investing in research and development. If they don't make money off these drugs, they're not going to invest no, money no in game, it, yeah. right? So they, there has to be a system where it helps them make money. Okay. The problem is, is that most common diseases or common things or things like that aren't very profitable Okay. because I can't, I don't get any special benefit from the FDA, right? So if you have like a rare disease that you're targeting or a first in class drug, which means there's no other treatments for that disease, um, you get fast track. So it takes less time, less research. Orphan Drug Act. You you also, you can get uh, what they have is these... If, if you do get it approved eventually, you get a fast-track um, voucher 
that you can sell in a secondary market or keep for yourself. And those huh. are worth like $150 million just themselves. You can sell these vouchers too. Yes. You can sell these vouchers to other companies to fast and, track and, their drugs. And it, like you can literally, you get a fast track pass on your molecule. You're like, hey, I want to sell this for a different molecule. And they'll transfer. So you just get a fast track. A I, I think there's requirements okay. on it. It's really weird. Yeah. So like, you have to understand that like companies who are trying to get drugs approved, they're trying to make money. Yeah. Right. Obviously, they're trying to help you, but their first goal is to make money. Which, okay, makes sense. And so sense. if you're targeting sure. something that makes the most money, it's generally not something that's like uh, sickle cell anemia, right? Because that's just going to be, there, there's such large people, who, large number of people have sickle cell anemia. Yeah. Your clinical trial size is going to be have to be massive. Right. And and to find effects sometimes with massive clinical trials can be hard because right. like there can be so many confounding factors that yeah. you're not looking at, so many things that you're not taking into account, and all this money you spend on this drug, right? And then at the end, if it gets approved or doesn't get approved or w w whatever, like what are you going to do? These gene therapies that that have been approved, they're trying to charge a million dollars. Right? Is it is the I conjunctivitis thing a million dollars yeah it's a million dollars yeah. for the gene therapy because yeah. that's the only way that they could theoretically make money but if you were to go buy this from a company yeah. the virus and the gene it probably cost you like five thousand dollars yeah it's just it's and so like do, does insurance pay for that like how many is this like gene therapy actually being sold <laughs> I, I mean, think, I'm, I'm actually curious yeah no no i think one person has got i think insurance companies and hospitals are trying to find ways to make this available to people because it's just like so ridiculously outside the norm. And you can imagine like if you had this blindness and somebody was like, well, it cost you a million dollars to get it fixed. You'd be like, oh no, like how do I do this? Yeah. How do I get a million dollars? And so the system is incentivized for people who are trying to make money. It's not incentivized for people trying to help people. Yeah. And that's uh. You know, that's unfortunate. And yeah. that's why gene therapies have such a hard time because everybody's targeting really rare, like, diseases. And a lot of times it's hard to find patients. Right. It's, uh, yeah. So what you're saying is that the clinic, like the, 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 the trial process of going through phase one, phase two, phase three is really, really high, super expensive. And like by the fact that these genetic therapies tend to target like rare diseases that the market opportunity just doesn't exist like the economics don't work out totally and if you know if there's one thing people in silicon valley should be thinking about disrupting it should be the fda because it's just like the most inefficient process known to human beings yeah and you're talking about getting drugs to pe medicines yeah to no people. it's it's an interesting conversation i mean i, I let's let's let's, let's dive into it a little bit because I, I know i've had a lot of conversations you know biology is from avasan yeah um, like he was, I think, I mean, this public, like he was like somewhat rumored to be like Trump's FDA commissioner and he's like, yeah. he's looking at it. I mean, it's his story to tell, but like he has similar, you know, questions around like, you know, how do you make that system better? Yeah. Well, and, I, and I think I, but I th like, like let's, how do we have like a fair conversation? Cause I think on the other side of the coin, I think a lot of people listening are probably like, okay, FDA. You know, their job is to like, make sure it's safe. They're like there to be like good regulators. And I think they have very good intent, right? I, I think the FDA totally. wants to like make, help people stay safe and, and not have like people, you know, give bullshit drugs and, and hurt people. Um, totally. But here's the thing yeah. is that like, say I make a drug that can cure two people, but kills the other eight that take it, right? Okay. That means the individual outcomes are crazy good right like if i can get those two people cured if i can get the drug to those two people or find those two people out of the 10 out of the 10 yeah. and get them cured like that would be awesome okay the problem is the fda doesn't work based on individual outcomes right right because the whole way clinical trials are set it's up population medicine exactly right? yeah. it's population medicine it's not individual outcome medicine right and what we need is a system that allows individual outcome medicine. Yeah. Because it sounds stupid, but, you know, like, people do crazy things. Sometimes they eat, like, grapefruit seeds to try to cure their cancer. Right. And if somebody were to tell me it's impossible to cure cancer with grape, grapefruit seeds, I would say that's crazy. It, there's 
probably somebody in existence out there who has a cancer that can be cured with grapefruit seeds. Right. right? Like, we don't understand the metabolism of their body or the cancer right. or what chemicals are all in there and how they're acting. And It's unlikely, but there is a non-zero probability. That there's a non-zero yeah. probability for sure. sure. I'm not yeah. advocating anybody ever yeah, try to use grapefruit yeah. seeds to yeah. cure cancer or anything like that. I'm just saying, exactly, there's a yeah. non-zero probability. We can't rule it out. Right. So it's like, how do we move science and medicine towards individual outcomes and away from population-based medicine? Right. Because how do we try to strive for these individual outcomes versus when somebody has lung cancer, we just say, uh, it's untreatable. You're just going to die in a few years. Right. And like, sorry, here's some chemo. Right. Yeah. No, and I think I think that's where your argument is the strongest. Like there are a ton of diseases where the standard of care is like, you're fucked. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like, okay, if like people are going to like are kind of screwed with the status quo, let them like try anything that they want. I agree. Right? And they're trying to make movements towards right. this. So they recently approved right to try, right. which means that um, drugs that are are in phase one clinical trial, patients can get access to them or try to get access to them right. now through laws. And there's helps protect companies with liability and things like that. Right. Um, which is interesting because you could think of a model where you just try to get a bunch of drugs into phase one right. to sell them to people to help them get treatments, right. <laughs> to kind of work around the FDA. That'd be a good company idea, right? <laughs> I mean, yeah, <laughs> kind of, right? But I think the intent is good. Right? Here's an interesting fair. thing, and here, here it comes to my point. There was a drug that was recently approved that's composed primarily of cannabidiol, right? Right. CBD for yep. seizures. Yep. It was approved. Obviously, in places where CBD is not illegal, not legal like we here in California, the it's drug costs now. Yeah, you know, yeah, it's yeah, legal here yeah. in California. Yeah. Other places where it's not legal, it costs seventy thousand dollars a year. And I did a calculation to Whoa. see like how the much would it cost if you just purchased it from, you know, the weed shop yeah. and it was like three thousand dollars. Yeah. And you're just like, so basically this is illegal, but it's also could be like a, an FDA approved drug for seizures. Yeah. It's really strange, but in some states it's legal. Yeah. And you could get it for like way cheaper. I, it's, I, I, mean, I think it just that's 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 definitely a kink in the system. I think, I think the path for marijuana being legalized is gonna happen, right? Like I think, yeah. like I think it's inevitable. I, I mean, who knows, right? Like Jeff Sessions yeah. is current AG is pretty anti marijuana. Yeah, but like, what about but, your dealings? And, and what do you think about the FDA? Or do you just hope to never have to deal with them? Is that your goal? <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, I think. We're lucky in the sense that we make foods and or, or and or supplements. So ketone, the, our ketone ester is a food. So you know we deal with the FDA in terms of like submitting the data around safety to make this like regulated as generally regarded as safe. So you know folks out there might have seen like the Impossible Burger. They yeah. went through a whole thing to make sure that they're. Their uh, the, the the soy hem yeah. was GRAS, so you know our ketone ester is grass. So we got that approved in 2015, actually. Oh, really? Wow, yeah. awesome! Yeah, yeah, I didn't even know that. Oh, cool. Yeah, so that, I mean, you know, a lot of credit to our partners at Oxford University for doing a lot of the heavy duty lifting there. Um, so that's the extent in terms of making a food, but in terms of therapeutics, that's something that we're interested in, right? So like, I, I think if you look at the literature on ketones and ketosis, a lot of interesting implications towards neurological conditions, obviously a lot of exciting data around diabetes, metabolic syndrome control, right? Reducing glycemic index. Um, so we, so, I mean, I, I think obviously when we go into medicine, start make, making medical claims, that's like a kind of a different beast, but- Oh, totally. Um, yeah, I mean, like it would be interesting to, yeah, how, how do you kind of, kind of fast track some of these things where they're, if they are just super safe, right? If like this is a food and there's like- ah, early, There's no way you can really fast track right? it. I think that's the problem. Yeah. I think the best thing to do is, well, you got two options. One is to open up a dialogue with the FDA right? and just like try to get things going and try to feel them out and what they're thinking. But they're always going to be- 
in the negative about everything. So always going to be like, this needs to be approved. That yeah. needs to be approved. That needs to be done. Yeah. This needs to be done. But like the, you know, the GR generally recognizes, say yeah. for the ketone ester, you probably didn't have to do that, right? Like you don't have to do don't. generally recognize as safe, but it, it like, it, that means that like you'll never run into issues down the road. Right. right? If something, if there is well, big some customers question, cares, right? Like so customers care with, and with, also with, with the like, U.S. military, with like oh they totally, care, oh right? totally. So and I think also, that's why like, like Impossible Burger had to do it. Like I don't think like the big guys would touch it if it's like not totally. Yeah. And also if like something went wrong right. and they're like, oh, we blame it on the ketone esters, and you're like, oh, hey, give us like two years to like do the research and <laughs> prove to you that it's safe. Yeah. It's kind of not a good situation to be yeah. in. So it is, it is very, very good. But, yeah. um, I think, uh, what I would do is find an ex FDA lawyer <laughs> or, or person who worked for the FDA. If you want me to put you in contact with one, I can <laughs> and figure out loopholes or ways to like work around their system. Uh, because it's, there are so many ways to work around their system. Yeah, that open up a lot of opportunities. There, there's some of them are risky, yeah. but it opens up opportunities rather than or at the same time as, you know, going through the whole process of yeah. getting something approved. Yeah, I mean, I think just our stance on it is that there's preliminary, you know, a lot of animal work, some early human work on some of these medical conditions that people are just experimenting with, right? And it's like if this is a food. And if you want to use this food to like run a faster marathon, and that's like the claims that we make in terms of athletic performance, great. But if you want to use this on your grandma, like, you know, we're not trying to check how you, you drink. Yeah, the your one thing about ester. the FDA, they're slow when it comes to approving something. But if you want to just talk with them or just set up a conversation, they like, I have never had problems getting them yeah. to respond to emails right. or anything. That's what I would say. Like, just open up dialogue yeah. with them. It's probably the the best thing you can do because usually they they are happy to yeah, talk to professionals. Them. Right? That's probably I, what they're I, I, all I, yeah. doing is just talking to people instead of approving all these <laughs> <laughs> drugs. <laughs> I mean, I think I mean there are interesting arguments around like how the drug pace has slowed a lot given the FDA hurdles where. Um, well, like penicillin went from like lab to bench or to bent to like hospital side yeah. in like two years or something. Yeah. Yeah. Scott Gottlieb, the current FDA commissioner or whatever has been trying to speed up. Yeah. And, and, and I think they have been getting a record numbers of approval, but it's, it's like ridiculously tiny. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, yay, we approved like 200 drugs last year or something. And they're like. Well, it doesn't seem like a lot. Right. Like for all the different diseases that yeah. exist. <laughs> so what is the dream state with, you know, what your work is? I mean, it sounds like there are, you know, to me, my interpretation is that you're almost arming people with the education, the knowledge, and now you have like the frogs, the platform to test some of these genetic therapies. And then you're not saying, hey, you know, go make your own gene therapy, but like, You've basically no, I mean, that's what we're trying to push it given towards. Given the tools. Here's oh, the thing. Okay. Is what I've learned is that like. So can, can you be like, hey, here, like, here's your own DIY like, genetic therapy test. Like you figure it out. Pro probably, and yeah, you, yeah, yeah. And like if this is going to work for your rare disease. And this is probably like, I, you know, I don't the master know. master plan. I think oh. when I was 18, I read The Art of War by Sunsa or whatever. Yeah. But like it's probably something like that. Like don't attack your enemy head on, right? Like. If the FDA is like cosmetic human genetic engineering is probably never going to be a thing. Yeah. You don't try to force it down their throats. Right. Instead what you do is you build up a base, you build up ways in which you can you know go around or or like have a community or like a, a population of people right. who support this technology yeah. or who like want this technology so that when, if you ever do have to approach them, then you're like, look, you know, 90% of the population in the U S is pro this technology. Yeah. Like you have to help us make this happen now. And that's kind of what we're going. We're going for the long, slow road of like educating people giving people access to technology, you know, the technology. Yeah. And then like helping them maybe learn how to use it on themselves. Maybe, right. maybe not. I don't know how, you know, that's going to work with the FDA and everything. But like, and then maybe when people are using this, 
when it's out there in the wild, when you have this huge base, then it makes your approach so much more easier, yeah. right? When you have people, yeah, other I mean, that people. sounds very sensible, right? Like, I think yeah. the rhetoric was a little bit like aggressive, like before, but I think that sounds like a very sen like a sensible statement, right? It's like, okay, let's educate people, let's, no. let's and let's like totally. work within the system. Well, I mean, maybe work within yeah. the system. It's figuring out, I think. If you're not going to work within the system, I, I used to be like a lot more, uh, you know, I, if I'm not going to work in the system, I would just burn, you know, let's burn it all down. Yeah. And now I'm more like, we could develop uh, things that are safe, effective, and work outside the system, perhaps, right? Instead of being all anarchic and like, burning everything down, right. we could develop ways that maybe work around the system, but also still provide people at scale something that's safe and effective. Right. And I think that's going to be what takes down the FDA or something like that, right? When they're like... The rhetoric, I mean, I would say, like, let's not take it down necessarily, but evolve them, enlighten them. Yeah, but uh, government institutions like that, like, <laughs> they, they don't, like, evolve. They just... they're. <laughs> they just die, <laughs> right? What I'm talking about is like I'm actually curious. Like, would that be like part of like the goal? Like, would you want to like eliminate the FDA? Like, you you I I would say that hey, like there's there's definitely some role for a, no. A like right regulator. now, the FDA does its job. Yeah, but if another system came along, yeah, it's then we saw that or evolve the mandate, right? Evolve the FDA's mandate. Yeah, I, but you you're you're disillusioned. I think on it's that. just yeah. I think like. You're talking about is it'd be like rewriting the constitution, right? Okay. It'd be like let's rewrite the because the FDA and all their regulations and all yeah. these things. I don't know if you ever read, you know, I've delved into a little bit like the Food, Drug, and Cosmetics Act and like yeah, all yeah, the yeah. different regulations. It's and, a big document, and it's just like all these different things. Yeah. And you're just like, it's going to be a beast to knock down. But the one thing that would knock it down is if somebody said, "Hey, look, I have this drug. I have this treatment. It's safe, effective." and all these people want it and need it, it works. I'm just giving it to them. Right. Nobody dies. Everything is safe, yeah. and it works. And then everybody's point of view would kind of be like... Uh, you, you, you'd force the institutional change at yeah, that point, you'd, right? You'd like, if you're like Uber, change. you're Airbnb. You're just like... Exactly. All right, this is reality now. The consumers want it. Like, we're just changing laws. But you can't do that too early. You can't just be like, you know, and some people have gone... You know, there are other there have been other biohackers and there are now who are trying to just like force it it. They're just like, here's everything. It's not safe, it's not effective, but we're just giving it away. Yeah. We're trying to get it, sell it to people or or whatever. And you're just like, no. That's like, messing it up for everyone. It's not gonna work, right. right? You can't just like give people stuff that's not safe and effective. Right. Like who's gonna want to use right. like, like everybody's gonna be like, these guys suck. No, right. you, you need to find something that's just you have to develop it. It's just T slow and patient. Yeah. 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 I mean, I guess like, like people really try to sell like genetic therapies that don't even work. Like they're like, hey, this oh, like, yeah. like maybe might work. Like, what's it? How does it even, like, there's not even a chance that it'll work. It's just like, no. Yeah. No, they just, I mean, don't, under they just don't understand their product. And they're just like, hey, like, I mean, some. there are a lot of hucksters out okay. there, man. Right. And everything. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I, I think that's a lot of reason that a lot of biohacking has been held back. Right. Yeah. Um, and nothing against those people who, you know, drink butter in their coffee or whatever, sell people butter in yeah. their coffee. Like, I, I'm sure it does help some people and stuff like that. But like, uh, we know that biohacking is a little bit more complicated and can be yeah. more complicated and more beneficial than just like butter in your coffee. Yeah. Right. Um, and that's what we're both trying to do is make that's it. That's why I almost like avoided the term of biohacker recently. Like I think it's just like a weirdly loaded term with like kind of amateur. It really is, you know. Right? But like, I, I, it's part of me kind of embraces that, and part of me not, you know, not, not amateur in like the hobbyist way. Like amateur is like they're just dumb. Like, no, I know, I, I, I know, I know what you mean. Yeah. yeah, no, and and part of me kind of embraces that because it's like, uh, you are. How do you say? Um, I don't want to say surprise people, but like. You have this advantage of people don't think that you're like capable, yeah, right. capable or serious, 
And like, it gives you an opera, it gives you like more wiggle room in a lot of different ways because people aren't expecting. Right. If you're just like, yes, we're like a drug company and we're going for this, like, oh my gosh, you know, everybody's, you know, the FDA, OSHA, everybody's going to be all over your your yeah. your grill and just like trying to make sure you're doing everything perfect yeah. and everything like this. But I think the stuff you're doing and the kind of stuff are doing is kind of trying to develop a new way of doing science, a new way of doing, uh, you know, I don't want to say medicine, but kind of a new way of doing medicine. And it's long and it's hard, but we're not traditional. Right. We're not. Yeah. And so it's like biohacking might not be the best term because of the people it's associated with, but it's like, what else? Yeah, what what is the better terminology? Because like we're not biopharma companies. Right. Right? We're not. I'm not we're probably not even biotech companies. Right? Just nothing like those well, I mean, companies. I kind of describe ourselves as like a hybrid biotech consumer. Yeah, company. right. Same right? exactly like, the same, right? Right. Yeah. <laughs> Some consumer biotech. Whenever yeah. I tell people yeah. that, they're like, what does that mean? Yeah. <laughs> I guess, yeah, I guess yeah. like like biohacking. I mean, yeah, I mean I think you're right in the sense that like there is some understanding of what biohacking is. I mean, I think the way I, I articulate at least to myself is that just like there was computer hacker or just in the homebrew computing exactly. club, they evolved into be computer scientists. And you want to know what started out in the beginning, what I see and what I've seen in biohacking, it starts out in the beginning where there's like a bunch of people who don't necessarily have a lot of credibility. Yeah. They just like are able to get publicity or hype based just on the fact that people are interested in right. this new technology. But over time, eventually, it's the players who have the credibility who went out, right? right? Just because like- but It's not the products that people want, right? It's yeah. It's like this, their stuff works. Exactly. Yeah. Like people want stuff that is credible. Yeah. And eventually those people who have less credibility or don't have credibility, they, yeah. you know, so yeah, maybe some of them will, will survive, but a lot of them just fall by the wayside and are gone. Yeah. And it's I, I just constantly see it, and especially in biohacking, right? Like if you were to ask like who were the names in biohacking like 10 years ago or something, like nobody even knows those people anymore. Totally turned over. Yeah, yeah. totally turned over. And it's, it's starting to get more and more credible and more and more robust. Yeah, so it's... Yeah, hopefully that continues, right? And hopefully we we'll stick around. Otherwise, that. you and I, we can really try to popularize this term <laughs> consumer biotech. <laughs> <laughs> that's 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 a sexy term. Yeah. I want to move on to some audience questions before we run out of time here. Because right. we actually do have a number of questions that people wanted answered. So let's let's run through that. Um, so Alejandra asks, uh, she read your interview with Atlantic a while ago. And in it, you mentioned that you consider yourself a social activist. Uh, and I think this kind of touches around the storytelling stuff that we were talking about. Did you get into biohacking because you believe that this is a, 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 a way to improve a part of society? It's actually a you great know, question. Yeah, I mean, Thanks, totally. That, that is exactly the reason, right? Is because, you know, talking about all this, it leads right back into all this stuff with the FDA and everything like that. What I saw was that, like, there was this, Amazing technologies, you know, biotechnology, molecular biology, genetic engineering, and all this stuff that, like, nobody had access to. And I was just like, what? It, it, if our century or our time is going to be the age of biology, which it seems like things yeah. are moving towards that, yeah. away from the age of silicon and to the age of biology, yeah. or merging silicon with biology. Our taglines, like, humans are the next platform. Yeah, like, exactly. Yeah. Then, like, people should have access to this technology. Yeah. People should be able to use this technology or learn how to use this technology. And that's kind of one of the huge things that inspired me. And at heart, like, I am just, like, I don't, it's social act. Like, my company, we go, we volunteer at, you know, local biotech organizations or whatever. We donate our time. We donate material. We donate all this stuff because, like, we are not just trying to, sell stuff though obviously we're trying to make money every company is yeah we're also trying to build a community develop a community build something that's sustainable and that requires more than just us or more than just a few individuals that requires everybody so yeah. it's 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 pure like like i think being a ceo is in general just social activism yeah right doesn't matter what you're doing like you're trying to 
do the most help with the least harm that you, that you can do. And yeah. Uh, yeah. No, I think, I mean, that just resonates with, you know, me personally, I think what we do with HVMN as well, right? It's just like, I think that the highest order of any company is kind of changing culture, right? If you can change culture, social activism, whatever you want to call it. At some point, you like business is like dealing with people, like products are for people. If you can change exactly. people, like that's like the highest order that you can influence the world around you. So I know I think that's a great question and great answer. Yeah. Um, so yeah, let's talk about it real yeah, quick. Yeah, no, no, I mean, that's a good, you know, like what Alejandra asked. So I've done a couple experiments that I've kind of like publicized yeah. or like, you know, had, you know, reporters and documentary crews. And that's generally not normal for like a science experiment or something. Um, and it seems very publicity hounding, and it is for right. sure. I'm not saying it's not. But the idea behind those experiments is to raise awareness. So one of the first experiments I did was this experiment to replace the bacteria in my gut, in and on my body, because I was suffering from gastrointestinal issues. And I found out that like a, a ridiculous number of people do. Some of it's linked back to antibiotic usage because antibiotics, right, they don't target specific bacteria. When you take them, they just like wipe out a large portion of bacteria right. in your gut, which can just be terrible. A lot of people have issues with their gut after this. And one of the major ways to treat this, which is actually outlawed in the United States, it's outlawed, huh. is to do a fecal transplant. And that's taking you know, feces from a healthy donor and transplanting it in your own body to help with, you know, unresolved gut issues. Right. Um, and it was, it's banned? I mean, it's explicitly banned? It Poop is a scheduled drug in the U.S. So that means that doctors can only prescribe it for the uh, intended indication. The uh -huh. only indication it's allowed to be prescribed for in the U.S. is antibiotic resistant clostridium difficile infections. Okay. So it's a bacteria that infects the body. If it's antibiotic resistant, if you can't wipe it out with antibiotics, the other uh, treatment is just to take like 30 grams of healthy donor feces. Yeah. And there's like a ridiculous cure rate, which is like 90%, I'm not even joking, it's like 90 something percent, right? Almost better, if not better than antibiotics. Yeah. And... That's the only indication it's approved for. So all their gut issues, it's not approved for. And it's crazy. Other countries in the UK, you can get treatments, uh, you know, these fecal transplants. So there's a lot of people will fly to the UK or someplace like that, go to a clinic there and get a transplant and come back. But yeah, in the US, it's it's not approved. And I thought like, wow, this I think this would be a great experiment to like do a scientific experiment, you know, get all the DNA from my gut, which you collect through the feces and sequence it, see what bacteria is in there, do a transplant and, and sequence my gut after, see if the, the don't, you know, taking the donor poop works, modifies the bacteria in my gut and see how it helps with the symptoms. And I kept like a spreadsheet of like all these different things, you know, what, what I was eating, my, you know, my weight, my physical activity, like my you know, mental aptitude and like all the sexual drive and like all these different things and did the DNA sequencing and DNA sequencing worked. Um, my gut health returned and it's been pretty great. Though keto, I would say kind of, it's been a little weird. I don't know. It if definitely people, ships your microbiome. Oh yeah, it does. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. Known to yeah so there was a little like, there's been a little adaption period yeah. where like, you know, been like, Oh, that, uh, you know, that little upsets my <laughs> stomach or something. But, uh, Stands the reason, right? If they're used to, totally. I mean, it's, like it's different fuels. But yeah, no, uh, and it really helped. You know, I wouldn't say cure because I think cure is a strong word, but right. it like reduced all the symptoms. I, like I, I have not had blood in my feces since I did that experiment. Um, and yeah, it was kind of a form of social activism, you know, to be like, look. It's got I, like quite I, a bit of PR, right? Like, yeah. Was it the first like? Yeah, it was one of the first big experiments I did there. Oh, like, what caught the attention of the media? Was it because, like, it was the first self-transplanted fecal transplant, or, or no? It was. It wasn't. It wasn't even the first. It wasn't the first one. What it was is the first time somebody documented it scientifically and like tested to see if it worked, see if their symptoms resolved, and all this right. other stuff. Right. So it was like the one of the first 
like tested on human, like you know, scientific experiments like right. this, uh, because it's like usually all was that like were your, what was your first exploit? Like what put you on the map? That was one of the was first. That the first thing that like it was like, the oh, first this. time it was in the press, but that was like one of that was probably the big thing because then there was a documentary that was made about there was a documentary crew, there was a crew who was filming there for for the Verge who was writing the article, yeah. but they got in a huge beef, so they just like you know left and decided to just make their own documentary and they did and it was phenomenal. It was that like South by Southwest and all these other places and like oh they're taping for Verge and then they're like it's on the New York Times now and it's on the Atlantic now like uh, so a bunch weird. of people that's, picked up the video. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, no, uh, and that was kind of like the first big experiment you know, of, of social activism was to just like, hey, there's here's a problem. And the same thing with my CRISPR experiment. Here's the problem. A lot of people are suffering from illnesses and diseases. Yeah. And you're saying CRISPR can cure it. Why isn't anybody using CRISPR on themselves? Yeah. And I'm just like, I'm going to see how easy it is yeah. and do this experiment on myself. And that's kind of like my form of social activism, like trying to push medicine forward, trying to cause change and, and like, the medical scientific community. Yeah, no, very cool. So James Reyes asks, what do you think will be the biggest advancement in genetic engineering in the next 10 years? The biggest advancement in genetic engineering? Well, I don't think it's going to necessarily be like an advancement, like we're going to learn how to do something new and crazy. I think it's just going to be like cosmetic human genetic engineering. I think that's going to, in the next 10 years, be something that happens on some sort of scale larger than one <laughs> or five. Interesting. Right? So I, like, like what would that be? Like muscle. I think, yeah, I think like it's going to start features. off. I think it's going to start off with athletic performance, okay. right? Because okay. like th it's so easy to measure. It's so easy to use. Yeah. Um, and I think in the next 10 years, probably in the next five years, you're going to see hundreds, if not thousands of people like trying this stuff just because like we talked about, it's so like the process is easy. It's just understanding, you know, what DNA you need, how to get that DNA, what you need to inject and how to inject it and how much and stuff like that. Yeah, right. And there's no like, you know. There's no handbook yet. Yeah. And that's what we're trying to develop. So I think once something like that is developed and out there, yeah, you'll see humans genetically modified. And it, the problem is, is like, if it starts getting used in sports, it's really hard to detect. And yeah. you're going to have uh, a lot of gene doping stuff going on. And it's going to be interesting for sure. It's going to really change sports, I imagine. Yeah. I mean, I think that's something that I think will inevitably have to be discussed. I mean, I think it's like a whole, we can have another discussion on it. But I mean, sport is about finding advantages, like, you know, against, yeah, like, that's, that's a definition, right? Like, if you're just taller than me, like, Kevin Durant's going to just like, he's unfair because he's taller than me, but like also there's much more skilled than me, but it's just like, how, what are the advantages that are okay and not okay? Totally. I think it's going to be an interesting. And like these gene therapies, right? They go away after some period of time. Yeah. Like it'd be just like taking steroid or anything else, except like there's no tests really for it. You could try to find tests. Maybe you could try to target, oh, well, this person DNA. has elevated, you know, like, Follow statin or IGF one well, people would say there's or, like the genetic passport, right? Like I guess like, but that's, that's not gonna matter. So right? hard. It's just like so hard to do. And like, what happens if somebody has normally elevated levels of that stuff, right? Like, is, is yeah. that just okay? What yeah. happens if you have like ten times elevated EPO levels than like I do? Yeah, I think that's why it's, it is messed up. Like in cycling, for example, as I mean. I, 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 working a lot of cyclists, like there's like a l max limit of like EPO or like hematocrit, like amount yeah. of iron in your blood. That's like, like 0.5 or something. So like literally every single cyclist is at 0.5. Yeah. And it's like, I'm naturally 0.5 and you're naturally 0.4 and you just hit, hit you like dope up the 0.5. Like it's not fair, right? Like you're <laughs> catching, totally. or like people with, uh, a lot uh, of people are asthmatic in cycling. Not because they maybe actually have asthma, but like it's a legal like the uh, lung steroids are legal if you have asthma. <laughs> and it's like, to me, it's like, ugh, okay, like, and like some like high percentage of cyclists have like asthma, like 20%. It's like, really? Like, you guys are elite cyclists. You guys all have asthma. Okay. Uh, that's funny. So it's like, okay, so some no, drug I mean, use right? is okay, and, and if right? If you told somebody like, look, I just inject this thing into you. And like, especially right now, because they don't even have ways to test it right now. Yeah. They're not even testing for it. Yeah. 
And if it's like, if I can get it in your muscle and not too much in your bloodstream anyway, like they won't be able to detect it without taking like a biopsy yeah, or something. Biopsy people. Right. Yeah. Like, like VEGF, this is vascular endothelial growth factor, which yeah. increases, uh, increases the blood vessel growth in the muscles, yeah. right? Angiogenesis. Yeah. So you can imagine increasing angiogenesis in your muscles to get more oxygen to them and perform better. Yeah, like, help. how do you detect that? Yeah. Like, what are you like? Do you have too many veins in your legs? You're excluded or something? Yeah, like, you can't test that. <laughs> like, yeah, like, yeah, you like take a snapshot of your leg every month and like, oh, this month you have way more blood vessels now. Like, it's a flag. It's like so right, I mean, it, it's it's ridiculous. Like, you can't test it properly. Yeah. And I think, I, and I agree with you. I think there's going to be some reckoning in sport where it's like, look, like, we just can't enforce this stuff. Yeah. I, that's my, that's my hypothesis. Yeah, they'll ignore it for as long as possible. And you know what's interesting? You know what they do in... Uh, um, <clears throat> So like sports where people are missing limbs and stuff like that, they have they actually have a point scale. It's really interesting. So like, like wheelchair basketball yeah. and stuff like that. So what they do in wheelchair basketball, they have different point scales. So like if you can only use one hand or you only yeah. have one hand, you 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 get a certain number of points scored. Right. You're like three points, and if you could use both hands, you're like five points. Right. And if you have no hands, you're like one point. You can only have a certain number of points on the court or field at one time. Yeah. So like a team can only have in their lineup out on the court like eight points. Yeah. Right? That's kind of a weird way to judge people, but sure. Yeah. No, it is, but it works, right? Yeah. Because like how do you have a team if where everybody, you know, can't ha use their legs, but they all have like perfect use of their hands. Right. It's weird. They're 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 gonna way out compete yeah. another team that doesn't. Right. So you can imagine in professional athletics if everybody you know has their genome sequence or something like that and they find these mutations or they find these you know gene dope they let say, you have a certain amount of like points of yeah. G genes or something yeah that's interesting yeah but like yeah, yeah I mean it's interesting right but then like you have some like Usain Bolt it's like that guy's gene is probably just like off the chart <laughs> like maximized for sprinting right, right? Just, like, exactly are exactly. we gonna right it's like it's not fair or like it's LeBron James he's like an animal it's like, like not fair at all like does everyone get to like just gene dope like all the way to LeBron James level genes like uh <laughs> I don't know yeah. maybe yeah I mean it's just like an unopened I guess uh, yeah, the commissioners and the league and the sports. We'll see how how they'll yeah. have to figure that out. I think. I mean, I guess people like us will supply them tools to like maybe like <laughs> let them do Here it. You guys, you guys figure out maximize what you your do. performance. Yeah. Well, I mean, before wrapping up here, um, you hinted at uh, you know the different products you're launching, but what are the what are the main things? Where do people find you? Um, or they can follow so, your yeah, work. So yeah, the company is uh, The Odin. Our website is the-odin.com. If you look at my name, Josiah Zane, you can find it on social media, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, whatever. I'm yeah. there. Find me. Send me a message. I usually try to respond to people. Yeah. Um, you know, we all of our kits right now are centered around genetic engineering and molecular biology, things like that. So if you're interested in learning about this technology, go check out our website. Even if you're not, you know, like, hey, Hit me up if you just want to have a conversation about some of this stuff. Yeah. Awesome. Hey, thanks for coming in. I, I think we got like we should do this more often. I think this will yeah, be a fun was, conversation. There was a lot of content, right? That um, was pretty good. And I'm sure like our audience <laughs> is gonna have more questions for you. So gotta do this again soon. Oh yeah, no, man. I'm I'm down, you yeah. know, just hit me up. Cool. We'll hey, appreciate it. it.